Good morning, everybody. Um, gonna try to start just a few seconds early because uh, chances are I will go over time. But uh, I'd also like to give you guys an opportunity to ask questions and uh, in the event that you can't read any of the slides or anything like that, be able to shout at me and say, hey, could you read that for me? Because lots of good stuff. Um, all right, so the first thing I want to ask you guys is, uh, how many of you guys went to Aaron's keynote yesterday? Nice. That's great, because uh, I was so psyched about his keynote, because it is such a great like, introduction to a bunch of the things we're going to talk about today. Uh, so without further ado, let's do that. So uh, today, my presentation, as you guys uh, all know clearly because you're here, is a Muggle's Guide to Tail Call Optimization in Ruby. Uh, I'll get into what I mean by that a little bit more in just a second, but first, let's consider uh, some alternate titles I was thinking of. Uh, so Harry Potter and the Well of Eternity, because um, uh, system stack errors can be a nightmare, especially those back traces that go on for days. And uh, just kind of wanted to get this out up front. Uh, Harry is a parcel tongue, and his scripting language of choice is probably going to be Python, not Ruby. Uh, so if we can start to kind of come to terms with that now, that'd be great. Uh, so kind of actually in that vein, uh, I want to also give you a warning. Uh, maybe not a warning, but like, for whatever reason, this topic, um, like I guess quite a few topics in our industry, uh, gets pretty religious at times, whether it's like Vim or Emacs. Uh, in this case, uh, we run into that divide between functional and object-oriented languages. Uh, so if you'll indulge with me for a moment, I'd like you to imagine, if you dare, a world without Miniswan. And for you guys who don't know what Miniswan is, uh, it stands for Matt's is nice, and so we are nice. Uh, and well, I don't know where that picture came from. I actually can't find it on the internet anymore now that I found it, but it's Matt's with a Matt's puppet. What the hell? Uh, all right, so from the blog of Guido von Rossum, uh, who, for those of you who may not know, uh, is the creator and inventor of Python. Uh, so back in 2009, there was a lot of talk going on about tail call optimization. Uh, and here are just a few select quotes, uh, comments from his blog related to it. How very Pythonic of you to make up stupid reasons for not implementing a very simple optimization. This is very Pythonic because it shows poor decision making, poor performance, and immature ideology. So I mean, very clearly, like somebody who uh, likes kind of more functional type things uh, and just can't believe that Python's not going to include it. Total opposite end of the spectrum, uh, refreshing that you stuck with your intuitions rather than submitting to these TCO requesting functional fiends. Like, uh, it's, uh, it blows my mind a little bit that a language feature can uh, incite so much uh, argument. But that said, uh, the good news is no matter which side you are on in this particular matter, because it doesn't matter, you're going to be right, because uh, everything, it's all about your point of view, right? Uh, so as Obi-Wan will tell you here, it's all, uh, everything kind of, kind of depends on your point of view. And also I should warn you, there's a few Star Wars references in here, despite the Harry Potter theme of this talk, because I am so excited. Uh, for next month, but uh, let's, uh, stay focused, stay on topic, move along. So, all right, good. I'm glad you guys laughed because somebody was threatening that I would get a Twilight crowd, and I am not prepared for that. So, uh, so what the hell is a Muggle? So, uh, for those of you who may not know, a Muggle in uh, the Harry Potter books is someone who lacks magic ability. Uh, now, if you're wondering why you care about this in this particular context. Uh, well, the way I want to present this talk is without magic. Um, and by magic, I kind of mean like, uh, I think you most often hear it with Rails, like Rails magic. It's doing all these like magical things behind the scenes for you, and on the other side of that magic emerges something wonderful, but uh, you have to like suspend disbelief in that middle process. But if you're one of those people who loves magic, uh, I don't mean to exclude you either. Uh, that works. Uh, but it's going to be up to you to decide kind of where the line between knowledge and magic should fall. Because uh, I, as much as I'd like to explain to you every minute detail of this, uh, we only have so much time. And uh, I just can't do it. So let's, let's get down to our subject. So uh, what is a tail call? Now, if when you guys hear the term tail call, you think about certain types of phone calls that happen between midnight and 3 AM in the morning. I'm going to need you to put down the Bud Light Lime, focus. And let's do this. Uh, so the kind of definition, uh, dictionary-wise, of a tail call is a subroutine call performed as the final action of a procedure. Uh, so that's a little bit terse, so why don't we like, look at this in action. So here's kind of like your canonical example, um, mostly canonical because it is just about as simple as can be. Uh, you have this method, uh, a call and tail position, and you have another method inside of it that is, is very clearly the last thing that 
the outer method does before it's complete. Uh, to contrast that with kind of your canonical counterexample, uh, you have another method, not a call and tail position, which calls other method and then adds one to it. Uh, so this kind of defies that definition we looked at because other method is not the last bit of action that is happening in this method. You have to still add one. Uh, and I know there are some clever folks among you who are thinking, ah, but what if we do one plus other method? Uh, still not a tail call because, again, um, it's not necessarily that it has to be the last thing at the end of a line or on the last line. Uh, it really just needs to be the last thing that happens in that method. Uh, before it's done. And in this case, both cases, once the result of other method comes back, we still have to add one to it. Uh, so the, the kind of interesting thing about this is it means there are very certain circumstances in which you can, you can make a tail call. Um, so some examples of those types of, um, they call them tail, or tail call sites, uh, are some of these. So in this case, we have like in the middle of a method, not even the end, uh, kind of uh, behind an if statement, we have this return sum call. This is actually a valid tail call because uh, it's attached to return, so really the last thing that this method does um, is this call to, to some call. Another one here, uh, kind of like those counterexamples we just looked at, is uh, this call with um, an expression inside the arguments. So this is different than the one we looked at before because by the time we actually call other call, uh, the, that, um, the expression my int plus one will have already been evaluated, so other call will really be our last um, our last operation there. You can also attach it to Boolean operations. So uh, you have false uh, or other call. That would work as well as true and other call because in both of those cases, uh, that other call is really just going to be the last thing that happens in the method. And the final example here and kind of what gets us into some of the real power that comes from tail call optimization uh, is this recursive count call, which really just uh, recursively will keep calling itself until it gets down to zero. So you kind of get like a five, four, three, two, one, zero type thing. Uh, again, this one I think is a little bit closer to that first example we looked at where uh, it's not too complex. You can really see that recursive count is the last thing, the last uh, operation that will happen in this function before it returns. And there are many more, um, which I'd be happy to talk about later if you're interested. Uh, so let's take a moment here to pause and reflect on recursion. Uh, so if we look at that uh, recursive count we were just looking at again, uh, you can kind of see that the output of it's going to be, as I said, five down to zero. And if we unwind the stack, we can kind of see the recursive count gets called, it puts five, checks to see if that's zero, and then calls itself again with four, uh, and it continues all the way down until you have your base case where you'll hit zero and you'll exit afterwards. Uh, when you have recursion plus a tail call like this, you end up with what is tail recursion. Um, and so. It's, it's a special kind of uh, recursion that's particularly useful when combined with tail call optimization because it allows you to do um, some really neat things uh, from a kind of like a functional perspective. Like if you're uh, familiar with Church's lambda calculus, one of the things that it was able to take advantage of is this kind of like tail recursion to actually make it so it re needed really many fewer operators in some of the like modern languages that we use today. Uh, and as we'll see uh, in a moment, uh, you can actually, uh, totally replace loops if you have um, tail call optimization. Uh, so in this case, you have side by side, uh, really kind of like the methods doing the same thing, but in one case it uses uh, recursion to implement that loop uh, and to track the state of the loop in like actually the arguments to the call versus iterative count, which tracks the state more inside uh, of the actual method body. Uh, so like the, the approaches are equivalent, but the, there's a catch. And, and so the thing is um, tail recursion heavily depends on having tail call optimization in many cases, uh, because there, there are some things functionally you just can't do if you don't have tail call optimization, because you'll just run out of stack eventually. Um, depending on like how, like the, some of the arguments and stuff that your method takes in Ruby, like whether it takes a block and uses special variables and some of those types of things, uh, usually it's somewhere under like 10,000 frames, um, kind of as uh, configured by default before you run out of uh, stack. So uh, for those of you kind of getting up in arms again about into our uh, kind of flame war here, chill out, let's, uh, let's just continue. So why don't we actually get an idea of what tail call optimization is? And perhaps you've also heard of this other phrase, what is uh, tail call elimination? Well, let's look at both of those. Um, so the trick is actually that they're really kind of the same thing. Um, one is talking about, uh, well, so like tail call elimination, though, I secretly want it to be kind of like a, I don't know, tail call destroying Terminator, um, 
and I don't know why someone on the internet made a Harry Potter Terminator. I swear it was not me, but I guess I shouldn't be surprised. Uh, so the trick is that, uh, that the tail call elimination really is kind of the optimization. Uh, so it's getting rid of the additional stack frames that you'd need when making a tail call uh, that is the optimization. Um, but I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself here, so uh, let's actually pause for a confession before kind of digging into it. Uh, so you'll remember before I mentioned um, that, so we had our recursive count function. And again, kind of as Obi-Wan alluded to, uh, this is only true from a certain point of view. Uh, and the point of view I've actually uh, depicted here is an environment that already has tail call optimization enabled. Uh, and the thing is I didn't mention to you that Ruby is not tail call optimization by default. Um, but we'll get more into that later. So what's really happening is, uh, in reality, each of those calls, as you can kind of see by the indentation here, uh, is pulling out another stack frame and allocating more memory and what have you so it can execute that method, um, which, which is fine if you're counting down from five. Uh, but if you're counting down from even like 10,000, like I, I'm not sure who really thinks that this is like, um, I don't know, a good way to move forward with trying to uh, use recursion in, in any language, really. Uh, so you can see here kind of your typical stack level too deep error that you'll run into. Uh, and again, we kind of come back to, oops, this quote, whoa. Uh, so a lack of tail call optimization here uh, has proven that in this case we really can't use this recursive solution because we just run out of the stack. Um, but on to actual tail call optimization to the rescue. So let's, let's actually figure out the secret magic that is tail call optimization and how it helps some of these situations. Uh, so as we discussed before, a tail call is by definition the final action of a procedure, which means that we can make some assumptions about uh, how our program is gonna work kind of after making that call. And the most important of these uh, ideas that we can derive from this is that nothing in the calling method is needed anymore. So uh, let's hold on to that idea and kind of figure out why we might be holding on to it if we don't need any of it. So, and actually, so there's a guy, uh, Guy L. Steele Jr., who I think was one of the uh, original writers of the scheme language, ha has this quote that I think also kind of frames this up in a good way. Uh, While we may prefer to think of a procedure call as meaning go do this other module and come back, that is only one possible interpretation. We must recognize that there are situations where coming back doesn't matter and these situations may be exploited. And that, again, I think is kind of the crux of tail call optimization. Uh, so, again, kind of focusing on if we don't need this parent stack frame, why might we, why might we be keeping it around? Uh, there are two main reasons. One uh, is if you'll kind of remember, Aaron yesterday mentioned that uh, in the YAR VM, uh, the keeping the stack around allows you to see your path through the VM. Uh, so if you do kind of like putz caller from IRB or kind of a debugging session, uh, that's what you're gonna see is really that stack frame that's being kept behind. Uh, the other thing it's useful for is keeping a record of where the result of each method needs to go so it can get passed eventually down to wherever it needs to get to. Uh, so of those two things, I'll say something perhaps controversial, um, but keeping a record of the execution stack I think is really just a convenience. That's really nice for debugging uh, but in reality is not something that's needed by any means for the program. So if we pretend like, you know, if we skip all the argument and pretend like we don't care about the complete call stack, uh, what can we do to try to avoid that and maybe cut it down to only one reason we need to keep these other frames behind? Uh, so is there any way we can get around uh, needing to know where to return the result of the tail call? As it turns out, no. Thank you guys for coming. Enjoy the rest of RubyConf. Uh, sorry, I don't know, rhetorical questions, uh, who knows. Uh, so if the stack frame of the tail call needs to know to return to its result to its parent anyways, why don't we just like circumvent the whole stack and just jump straight from like your deepest call to where it needs to get to? And that is really kind of like the magic of tail call elimination is you can avoid some of those uh, stack frames um, and save a lot of computation and memory needed, and actually enable a lot of functional solutions. Uh, so I kind of went through that quickly. Uh, questions right now? Tylenol, anything? Pause for a drink while you guys think of your questions. All right, I'm either doing a really good job or I lost you guys all five minutes ago. And should have paused for, oh, sorry.
so the question was, uh, I said before that it was not enabled by default, and uh, the gentleman suggested compiling your own MRI uh, to get it to work. We'll actually get into a bunch of ways to make it work uh, in just a moment, um, so if I can ask you to bear with me. So uh, one thing to kind of clear up before moving on, uh, why stop kind of with that? Um, if you're going to like just kind of circumvent the parent anyways, uh, why, why create a new stack frame and then, I don't know, uh, cut the parent out after that? Uh, in practice, what really happens is uh, you, I don't know, you don't end up circumventing the parent. You, you just reuse that same frame to do the next thing you're gonna do. So there's no, I don't know, something about elimination to me kind of suggests that there, there's this extra stack frame that you like avoid creating or like, I guess like this extra stack frame that you get rid of. Um, but the reality is you just, uh, it's kind of like recycling. It's like green programming. Uh, so here's kind of our countdown function again. And on the left, you can see what it kind of looks like without tail call optimization. You go three, two, one, zero. Uh, but on the right, with tail call optimization, you can see we're just reusing one stack frame to go through every one of those uh, iterations. So that's all well and good, but as this guy said, if it's not in Ruby, uh, then no offense, but I really don't care. So about that, uh, Ruby is tail call optimized, as it turns out, sort of. Uh, and so uh, it's actually been built into the RVM since Ruby 1.9.2, uh, but it's actually never been enabled by default. There was some discussion of perhaps enabling it by default around the time that Ruby 2.0 came out, uh, but nothing ever came of it. So let's look at how we can uh, get in there and play with it. So uh, there should be a warning for you here, as uh, the dragon will illustrate. Uh, I imagine not a lot of people are using this in production, so uh, don't, I mean, don't ship it to production and then write me later and say, listen, man, you said this was gonna be great and it was not great. Uh, I don't know, test it out. Like, I think, I, I think there's a lot of opportunity for it and I've not run into like any weirdnesses where you suddenly run into like seg faults or anything like that. Um, but but uh, again, I would say uh, use caution. So there are a few different ways that you can enable this. Uh, so as this gentleman back here suggested, you can uh, compile your Ruby with um, the flag switched around so that it's enabled by default. Uh, you can get into Ruby VM instruction sequence, sequence which Aaron mentioned yesterday, and uh, it's actually one of those optimization options in there. Uh, you can also create like a, an in, your own instance of Ruby VM instruction sequence, kind of like there's like a global versus an instance one. Um, probably best not to screw with the global one though sometimes it's handy because uh, things like require and load uh, will use like kind of the global instruction sequence to compile that stuff. Uh, whereas if you, even if you, ha even if you set up an instruction sequence with tail call optimization enabled, if you call require or load from it, uh, you're not gonna get tail call uh, optimized code loaded. Uh, and so the last one here, uh, full disclosure, I am the author of this gem. Uh, I created this to play around with tail call optimization. Uh, there's a TCO method gem that allows you to kind of, uh, I don't know, it's experimenting with different APIs to try to make it accessible and, uh, I don't know, kind of feel normal. Uh, so I like to pause here for awe because, uh, I don't know, there's something to me that I think is really astounding about a VM that you can like have tail call optimization enabled over here but not over here and, I don't know, that's, that's pretty awesome and uh, I think really speaks to the power and uh, as you kind of saw with some of the C code that Aaron dug into yesterday, uh, the complexity of the VM that Ruby runs on top of. So, uh, how to patch your Ruby to have tail call optimization enabled by default. Uh, I don't necessarily suggest that you just go out there and take anyone's patch from the internet to modify your Ruby VM, um, but you can trust me, I'm a software engineer, what could go wrong? Uh, so actually, this is really the diff, like you really just need to flip two flags. Um, something worth noting is that when tail call optimization is enabled, you can't use the trace instruction, uh, which you may be familiar with as, uh, what is it, set underscore trace underscore func. I don't think I've actually ever really seen anyone use it, but uh, I'm sure there are reasons. I'm sure it's out there somewhere. Uh, so as I mentioned, Ruby VM instruction sequence is also kind of a gateway uh, to getting into there. Won't go into great detail about that class itself, but uh, there's a lot of like kind of neat things you can do to kind of like, I don't know, get in there and like play with the VM and get an idea of like what's going on. Um, so I definitely encourage you to look at it. Um, Aaron yesterday mentioned the book uh, Ruby Under a Microscope by Dan, or Pat Shaughnessy, and I would definitely recommend that too. Uh, there's a few things he gets into in there which I feel like uh, will help you kind of better understand how you can use this to like get an idea of what's going on under the, under the covers, um, but also I think give you a ton of insight into how the Ruby VM is running and uh, again, kind of some, one of those like, 
uh, awe, awe type moments where it's really like, this is crazy. Uh, so this is how you could selectively uh, compile code at runtime using RubyVM instruction sequence, just if you wanted to go with the totally vanilla, not going to pull a gem, another dependency into my project. Um, so hold on to these IC guap sequence option uh, constant up here at the top, because I'm not going to repeat that later just to make things easier for you guys to read. Uh, but again, you can kind of see it's really the same thing we were doing in the diff, uh, where we uh, turn on tail call optimization and have to turn off the trace instruction. Uh, and it's worth noting that even if you turn on tail call optimization but don't also turn off the trace instruction, uh, you will not get tail call optimization. But oddly, um, I don't know, I guess the trace instruction kind of like overrides it, which is something to watch out for. There were many times where I was like, why, does not, why doesn't this work? But that's the trick. Uh, so in this case, uh, let's actually like see if we can look at like a real kind of example of how that works. So in this case, uh, one thing I find a, kind of like clunky about this particular approach is that uh, you may have noticed in Aaron's talk yesterday, you have to like just pass it like the raw code strings, which um, uh, this particular code highlighter is doing a good job, or let's say a bad job actually, because it's highlighting a string as though it were code, but uh, in like Vim or something else like that, you'd probably just have a whole block that looked like a string there. Um, but yeah, you have to take just like this string and then pass it to the Ruby VM instruction sequence object uh, to evaluate it and actually turn it into a, a runnable bit of code that would have tail call optimization enabled. Uh, so to try and combat that, um, I tried to encapsulate at least some of the stuff of uh, actually generating that instruction sequence object. Um, so again, here, you still have to use code strings, uh, which I think are always going to be clunky. Uh, but it, it gets a I don't know, I guess you at least have to have a li little less knowledge of what's required to actually make this work uh, recursive or with tail call optimization. Uh, another API I've been playing around with for this is to use like a mix-in that does kind of like method decorators. Uh, so you can see here, it adds this TCO method mixin, um, which gives the class this TCO module method. Um, so after I've defined recursive factorial in this module, I can then use this like method decorator to say, hey, uh, that should actually be compiled with tail call optimization. And behind the scenes, uh, I don't know, it's, it's kind of hacky, so again, probably not, the, not production quality stuff, but it'll go find that method, find the source for it, and basically run through everything we just saw with the instruction sequence. Uh, which I think personally is definitely prettier than a system stack error. And uh, another kind of API I've been playing with, uh, this one's kind of new, but I think it is actually getting close to more idiomatic Ruby, is you can just do a block of code, and whatever is in that block will be evaluated with tail call optimization. Uh, the big catch for this one, though, is uh, still under the covers it's turning this into a string and evaluating it. So even though you have this block here, uh, you're going to lose your block scope. You're going to lose the scope. You're not going to be able to access things outside of it and vice versa. If you, describe, if you define something inside this block, uh, things outside of it won't be able to get to it. But maybe that's a um, trade-off you're willing to make. And that's actually part of the reason in this case I kind of treated it more like, um, I don't know, I think, I think it's really nice if you're kind of like using a strategy pattern where you have a particular strategy of something that perhaps would benefit from tail call optimization. So in this case, I'd you know, use this TCO method, or uh, with TCO method, and um, then define a module inside it to kind of uh, take the strategy type approach. So uh, let's talk kind of like, again, about like what some of the benefits are here. So Ruby is a multi-paradigm language, uh, which really means that Ruby kind of takes the best um, a bunch of different languages and uh, consolidates that into the awesomeness that you and I all, and we all know as Ruby. Um, but uh, in its multifaceted approach, uh, you run into kind of that same flame war where you have uh, the very object-oriented people in Ruby who makes a lot of sense because Ruby itself is so object-oriented. Um, but with the introduction or like the, uh, the presence of things like procs and lambdas, uh, you really have a lot of functional power too. So uh, there is still, even like within Ruby, this divide and uh, kind of falls into this multifaceted thing. Uh, so uh, on the functional side of things, tail call optimization enables a wider range of functional solutions by better enabling uh, recursive solutions, including tail recursion. But that's not to say that there is not also an object-oriented benefit. Uh, the example of it is a little too much to go into in this particular case. Uh, but again, the, the guy I mentioned before, uh, Guy Steele, uh, a few years ago in a blog post made a good, I don't know, made a good demonstration that uh, by having tail call optimization, you can actually have uh, better abstractions. Um, the idea being that uh, with some things, 
if you can, if you can like call it and, ex and not have to worry about it stack over, like you running out of stack because of recursive calls, you, in many cases, need to know less about the internals of another object. Um, so I think, the, I think the straw man you put together is like kind of, uh, I don't know, it's not, it's not something you'd use every day, but I think the fact that uh, he, I don't know, I think that the fact that there is kind of a demonstration of, that, of it at all demonstrates that at least to some degree, uh, tail call optimization definitely does benefit object-oriented designs, not just functional ones. Um, did some experimenting also, and I found that uh, tail call optimization also helps performance. Um, what may or may not be obvious is that one, when you kill those stack frames uh, that are otherwise just lying around, you can actually garbage collect um, those objects a lot sooner. So if you have like, um, I'm not sure what a good example would be, but if you had a method that did a lot of uh, object allocations and ended up holding on to a lot of memory somewhere back in the stack, even if you're never gonna go back there, uh, you potentially are still holding it and actually can't like, release that memory until you unwind the stack, get rid of that frame, and move on. Uh, you also get better performance uh, and a benefit from reusing stack frames um, instead of just creating new ones every time when perhaps you don't need to. Uh, I think there's also a good language crossover opportunity here because with ECMAScript 6, JavaScript uh, is now supposed to be tail call optimized. I think it'll be really interesting to see how they make that transition. Um, I don't know that any of the major browser vendors yet have actually released um, an engine that, is, that has tail call optimization enabled, but uh, it's definitely in the spec, and I haven't heard anything about people like trying to pull it out yet, so uh, we'll see what happens. Uh, so, and now kind of on the, the, the flip side, why not tail call optimization? Uh, and again, so the thing I kind of brushed over earlier, uh, the stack frames that would be part of a tail call optimization uh, are eliminated from the stack, which makes debugging much more difficult. Um, and actually, it makes like certain gems, like uh, if you ever use like uh, pry by bug or pry nav or pry stack explorer in particular, like these guys are going to be. I'm, I, I imagine would probably seg fault if you tried to run it against a, a Ruby compiled with uh, tail call optimization enabled. Uh, so definitely not as nice a debugging story. Uh, as I mentioned also earlier too, there's that use uh, or that set trace function, which again haven't seen really in action, but uh, is something to watch out for being broken if you were to turn on tail call optimization by default. Uh, as you saw with kind of some of those examples, since you have to like work with these strings of code, they can be it can be pretty cumbersome to use as it stands. And again, as I mentioned, uh, since it's relatively unused and untested despite its availability, it's something to watch out for. Uh, I actually tried to, so I, I spun up a, a version of Ruby with 2.2.3 uh, with tail call optimization enabled uh, and tried to run the Rails test suite, and it was, it was pretty good, um, but there were definitely things that failed that didn't fail uh, with a, like a vanilla form of 2.2.3. Um, who knows if it's, I, I don't know, I'm not sure if it's really important things. I didn't kind of like dig into each of the, the failures, but uh, definitely, I would say an argument for not running your Rails server with tail call optimization enabled. But again, like, uh, I think there's still potential for situations where perhaps you want to use a strategy, because uh, I don't know, I don't think you really need it everywhere, but I think there are cases where uh, you can maintain a lot of elegance and you can uh, get a lot of performance and um, just have solutions that you wouldn't otherwise be able to get to without tail call optimization. And uh, in my experience, Experimentation, I found that there's still some weirdness around what constitutes a tail call. Uh, we looked at a few examples earlier, but um, it's hard to figure out. Like the VM, for the VM, it is hard to figure out when you're not, like when you don't need the rest of that method body. And so in some cases, you have to kind of do kind of like weird things to get to a point where you can actually tell it, or where it will actually know that, okay, I don't need the rest of this method, I can leave. Um, I don't have an example here, but in some cases where if I just like made sure that even though no code path could reach the end of the method, if I just put a nil there, it, it, would, it would optimize it. Whereas in other cases, it would just be like, I better hold on to this, I'm not sure what's gonna happen. Uh, so some weirdness there, but it may be unavoidable without, uh, I don't know, changing some of how the VM works. That's it for the presentation. Um, if you guys are curious about me, uh, you can find me on GitHub. I wrote a bunch of stuff about this on my blog. Uh, like actually, if you enjoyed Aaron's walk or the walkthrough yesterday of where he was kind of like uh, digging into how some of the uh, I sequence stuff and what have you, 
Um, I went on a voyage to try to figure out the source of tail call optimization inside of Ruby. Um, and there's lots of C code, so beware, but uh, I don't know, I, thought it, I found it very informative and again, like, kind of like, um, kind of awing and just that it, it I don't know, it, to me it seems pretty magical. So um, I work at Datto in Boston. We do business continuity, which is a fancy way of saying backup. Um, we, uh, here you have us with uh, Hillary because we're actually one of the companies that had Hillary's emails. Uh, so if you guys are interested, I can maybe uh, hook something up, just let me know. Uh, but that is it. Thank you guys all very much. And if you have any questions, I'm here and we have time. Uh, the question is if you have to do any Ruby recompilation uh, if you use the mixin, and you do not. Because uh, luckily, like, the, again, like, that's kind of what is like, awesome about it is like, you just like, tweak a setting and suddenly you can just say, like, ah, I don't need those stack frames, whatever. Um, and then you can have just things running in totally different places that uh, have those different ideologies. Like, yes, I want the stack. No, I don't want it. And uh, they work fine together. Right, yeah, exactly, because you can just isolate it. To, or sorry, and so he said then you wouldn't crash Rails or your, uh, whatever. And, uh, and that's true because, uh, yeah, because it would just be isolated to whatever scope you had kind of uh, compiled with tail call optimization enabled. Absolutely. Yeah, so sorry, so the question was, uh, let's say you kind of went the other way and you're like, okay, I'm gonna compile my Ruby with tail call optimization enabled by default. Could you then have like blocks of code that you compiled without tail call optimization? And yes, you definitely could. You just would kind of like flip those options around, turn back on the, well, potentially turn back on the trace function, turn off tail call optimization, and then you should be able to compile it uh, as you might expect. Well, yeah, I think that's a good point. I think there's lots of situations where just by, oh, sorry, and so the question is how often when you run into a stack error uh, is tail call optimization the solution? And I think there are definitely a lot of situations where, uh, you know, in, accidentally you've called something that's like just infinitely calling itself in a loop. Uh, so, and yeah, obviously in those situations it's, it's not gonna help, but I think there are situations where um, if, uh, for example, I guess uh, I suppose like one of the ones that we looked at was like, uh, uh, with like generating kind of sequences like Fibonacci or um, uh, what was the other one that was in here? Factorials. Um, but again, kind of in the keynote, if you guys were there at the keynote yesterday afternoon, if you were doing that for work, I'd like to know where you work because I don't know who's generating Fibonacci and factorials for work. Um, but but I, think, like, I think there's definitely an argument for in some algorithms uh, being able to say we don't care about the stack here and thus allowing you to kind of proceed in a recursive strategy. Um, perhaps something like parsing HTML would be really good for this. Anything that like kind of has a tree structure is really gonna naturally uh, follow a kind of a recursive strategy, I think, really well. And in those situations, it might be nice to say, okay, let's change the game here and let's, let's just recurse as much as we want. Yes. Uh, so I have, so the question was if I've, uh, if I've benchmarked uh, any of these comparisons. Um, and I have some, um, but uh, frankly I didn't see a tremendous benefit from it. I thought uh, in at least my experiments, I think it was probably with generating large uh, factorials that there was not a significant speed up. Uh, but I was mostly looking at execution time. Um, potentially there's a uh, benefit there from allocating, uh, allocating. Uh, allocating fewer objects and thus avoiding garbage collection pauses and things like that. Uh, but generally speaking, it seemed fairly, fairly similar to me. Uh, yeah, uh, nice, good question. Uh, this is actually something I ran into some, uh, sorry, so the question is, uh, if, if there's any way to tell if a method is tail call optimized without actually just trying to force it into a stack overflow. Uh, and the, so this is a, a problem I actually ran into in trying to test the gem to make sure that when it compiles something, it's actually doing it with tail call optimization. Depending on how you structure the method, there are a couple different ways. Um, the probably like most rigorous way to do it is using uh, the Ruby VM I instruction sequence object. You can actually take uh, a chunk of code uh, and uh, as I think like Aaron showed yesterday, you can actually get it to translate it into like the ARV instructions that it'll run. And uh, when, when it is tail call optimized, there are certain flags that will appear in the instructions. Uh, so it's not like a bulletproof method, but I think it's the, the most reliable. The other thing you can do is like, uh, you don't have to go all, all the way to the extreme of stack overflow. If you just call the method once and can check your stack, if it worked, you should have eliminated the last stack frame. 
uh, so it shouldn't really grow. It should kind of say, stay static, which is another way uh, you can test it, and th that's the way that I went with for uh, the gem, just because I think, I don't know, uh, I, f uh, I feel more confident about actually seeing that the stack frames are eliminated compared to uh, the VM telling me that it's compiled it with tail call optimization, so. Other questions? Uh, the question is if I've tried to force uh, an exception with this and trying to see if something like RPM uh, agent or things like that would break because of perhaps a dependency on being able to analyze the stack. Uh, for New Relic, I have not tried it. Um, for, for Rails, it definitely seemed like there's some potential for it. Like some of the exceptions I remember, it seemed like that perhaps, um, perhaps for some of the lookup stuff it uses, some of the call stack to try to figure out whose parents are whose, because some of the failures that were happening is uh, modules not knowing the right nesting. Um, so that's potentially one place you could run into issues. Um, where else might cause a problem? I think New Relic is like a great, a great candidate for a problem, because uh, I would imagine that it probably does some of that like tracing of the call stack to figure out where and what your program is doing to kind of give you uh, some of the metrics that it does. Other? Yes? Um, the question is, what do I think would need to happen in order for the greater Ruby community to be interested in tail call optimization and to see it uh, more easily accessible in MRI? Uh, that's something, actually, I've asked myself a lot in regards to this talk, because um, in, in light of, like, there being some talk about it around 2.0, it seemed like another opportunity to kind of reflect and say, is this something we want? Does this benefit the community? Um, I think... Personally, I think the best way to do that would be to kind of uh, probably make it more, uh, I don't know, like add some kind of like language primitive to be able to do it so you could like have a method that is compiled with tail call optimization. I think that's, to me, that I think makes the most sense because it's usually like you have a particular method that you want to work with that in. Um, but then, I don't know, you potentially run into some issues where it's calling things that aren't getting tail call optimized and so you're getting like some parts of the stack left behind and others not. and um, I'm not, I'm not sure if that would work. I think actually on the, like the Ruby issue that talked about making it able by default, uh, there was a note there that was saying if they wanted to introduce some kind of language primitive, uh, it would be somewhat difficult the way that the VM was constructed at that time. Uh, but personally, I think that would be the way to do it, to make it, uh, to make it so it's easier for people to explore and to get curious about it. Like, uh, that's actually a lot of what drove me into learning about tail call optimization at all. It's kind of like, yeah, it was a, a, you know, at a stand-up meeting at work, and someone's like, oh, if Ruby had proper tail calls, we could do this, this, and this, and I was like, I have no idea what you're talking about. So, uh, but then uh, there's a guy, uh, Nathan Bacall, posted a blog post um, saying like, oh, hey, Ruby does have tail call optimization under the covers, and uh, presented with that, I, I finally had like, somewhere I could go explore and say, what is this tail call optimization? And, and personally, I think that uh, making that more available for people to explore their curiosity, I think would really help, number one, figure out if we, we care about it, um, and hopefully push it forward as something in the language. Uh, let's follow a question. Uh, nah, I mean, yes, there definitely are. I was gonna say, I was gonna say not that I know of, but I, I don't have personal experience with any of them. The question, sorry, for those who couldn't hear, was uh, are there any other optimizations in Ruby, uh, in the VM, that we might be interested in playing with? Uh, I think Aaron showcased a couple yesterday, um, though it was never quite clear to me how those played into the stuff he talked about, but uh, that might be my fault. Um, but there are definitely, I think there's like, there's a, a hash of options you can hand, hand that particular thing, and I think it's like eight or nine different things you can turn on or off, and uh, they're meant to be VM optimization, so I think there's definitely something there that in the right use case um, could help out. Um, the question is, do I know the status of uh, what tail call optimization is in other Rubies, like Rubinius or JRuby? Uh, I don't actually have any idea. Um, I don't know, so, sorry, I was trying to, like, so one thing I know is, like, uh, in researching this, Java is, enough, is one of the, like, major languages that got lampooned a bunch for not having tail call optimization enabled. Uh, that said, um, that doesn't mean JRuby couldn't have it, because it's, it's a VM, like, JRuby is running a VM that runs Ruby, um, so I, I would think that they definitely could do it if, uh, if it were something that uh, Hedius and them were in, into. Um, I have less knowledge of uh, Rubinius, um, but again, like I would think that all of these things are probably building a VM in some other kind of uh, lower level language on which they compile and run Ruby. So I would think it's definitely possible, though I don't know if they've uh, tried to achieve it. Again, mostly because uh, in MRI Ruby it's like there, but it's not, um, 
really needed. It's not required for anything. So, Actually, sorry, a follow-up to that. Um, uh, I don't know, you'd have to speak to Charles Nutter more uh, specifically about this, but I'm pretty sure I've seen him tweet that running like the Ruby test suite against JRuby has been successful in places, uh, or maybe uh, fully, um, don't quote me on this, but there are tests to test that it works. Um, so if JRuby is really running the Ruby test suite on their VM, then I would say it's in there. Um, but that's, uh, I don't know, guesswork. Oh, what situation might you enable it in production? Uh, I would think like, Certainly not a web server, uh, given kind of what uh, my experience with Rails was there. But I think there are probably native type applications where uh, just per, perhaps for performance or to minimize um, the amount of memory used by the Ruby VM, you might want to use it for those reasons. Um, that said, depending also on your style of programming, if you were more functionally oriented, uh, you might want to do it so you can kind of have all of the, the niceties that come with it uh, kind of from a functional perspective. Um, and also, if, if you have a particular algorithm that you think would benefit from being able to recurse indefinitely, um, that, I think that would be another situation for it. Um, again, I think anything that kind of um, is related to uh, trees, uh, linked lists, which are kind of like a, a, a tree with just one limb, um, any of these types of things, uh, I think, really uh, work really nicely with recursive solutions. And I think if, if those are things you work with a lot, it might benefit you to uh, to try turning off tail clop or turning on tail clop optimization. Last chance. All right, guys, thank you so much for coming. Um, thank you.